Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist. I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA, episode 115 for the week ending, August 10th, 2018, the Boston Massacre edition. Now, a word about our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional independent integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 600 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more inf- Having watched his beloved Boston Red Sox sweep the hated New York Yankees in a four-game set at Fenway Park, i.e. the Boston Massacre, Jay is back from a well-earned vacation. Today, we look at some of the week's top compliance stories, including the retirement of Ben D. Pietro from the Wall Street Journal Risk and Compliance Journal. Mike Volkoff continues its exploration of the uses of blockchain and compliance. We ask whether Elon Musk's tweet about going private violated securities laws. Uh, the J. Lo mega yacht sails into Malaysian waters. What happens next? Uh, the DOJ Cyber Task Force issues its first report. Uh, we have some uh, shell company uh, issues and money laundering as Sam Rubenfeld reports that Canada has emerged as a money laundering hub. And in the lower 48, 24 state attorney generals lobby for some sunshine around shell corporations. Uh, We touch on lease obligations and the big change in accounting. We note a new commentator in uh, the law and compliance space. It's Jonathan Rausch, formerly Senior Vice President and Head of Anti-Bribery and Corruption Governance at Wells Fargo. Uh, We also speak to the celebration of my 1,000th podcast. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist, together with Mr. Monitors, Jay Rosen, back again for another episode of This Week in FCPA, episode 115 for the week ending, August 10th, 2018, the Boston Massacre edition. Having watched his beloved Boston Red Sox sweep the hated Yankees in a four-game Boston Massacre in Fenway Park, Jay is back from a well-earned vacation. We had uh, quite a few uh, compliance and ethics stories this week, Jay. So you want to just jump right into it? Let's go. Take uh, number one, Tom, with uh, one of our good friends at the Wall Street Journal Risk and Compliance Report. Yes, Ben D. Pietro has announced his retirement from the Wall Street Journal Risk and Compliance Report, and he announced via Twitter, uh, very social media savvy. Um, Ben has been a a great journalist in the compliance space. He's been with the Risk and Compliance Journal since, I think, 2013, if not the first, one of the first uh, reporters on that most excellent site. It's the only major daily that uh, details uh, bri- it's, it's not just bribery and corruption. It's a much broader remit. Truly is risk and compliance. Uh, ben uh, does the uh, the weekly crisis of the week uh, column where he talks about uh, some reputational or other crisis that corporations have responded to from the com- uh, communications angle, which I think is truly a must read. Uh, if you don't know Ben, he's, he's a great guy. He is an old school journalist and he's been uh, a good friend. He's been a great journalist and uh, I'd be very interested to see uh, the next uh, stop in his journey. Do you have a prediction, Tom? Uh, I do not. I do not. Okay. So uh, next up, we had another couple of uh, interesting blog posts, Jay, from uh, Mike Volkoff and uh, our um, Everything Compliance colleague. Uh, Mike has become very interested in the use of blockchain in compliance. Uh, You want to talk about uh, what he wrote about this week? Yeah. uh, Mike did a two-part blog post about uh, revolution of blockchain and compliance and then real app, real world applications. And um, basically Mike is really interested in not only um, how blockchain works, but the definite um, possibilities it holds in 
being combined with different type of regulatory steps. And whether that's fintech or regtech, um, where Mike believes there's a lot of power is in the technology, which is at the core of blockchain, which is DLT, a distributed ledger technology. And he feels that, um, you know, there, there's still a way to go, but there is a lot of work that you can do in terms of uh, transparency of transaction and doing due diligence on third parties and joint ventures. So he believes that one of the next advancements will be using the underlying core of blockchain to really help the compliance practitioner do their job. Um, those are my takeaways. What about you, Tom? So Mike has really been one of the in the forefront of this, and he continues to help us understand what blockchain is and how it will be used going forward. Uh, I agree with Mike that it is a fabulous uh, tool, and it will be one that will be incorporated into compliance programs in short order. So it's uh, going to be one more thing compliance officers uh, they may have to think about, but I think at the end of the day, it'll be a great opportunity for compliance. Um, your friend, Elon Musk, was in the news. Uh, My friend? Uh, or I should, well, uh, you're both from California, so okay. uh, didn't everybody know everybody? And, and, and we're both multi-billion dollar uh, people who created uh, internet applications and uh, like to tweet, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but he was in the news this week. Um, he uh, has been in the news a lot lately. It's uh, if it's one thing he does, it's market, and it's market him. And unfortunately, this week he was in the news because he tweeted out that he had secured funding to take his uh, automobile manufacturing company Tesla private at a share value of four hundred twenty dollars per share. Uh, this set the market into a complete tizzy. Um, to use uh, one of my daughter's, uh, when she was seven, favorite words. Uh, but uh, it was such a tizzy that the market had to suspend uh, trading of Tesla shares. So it's unclear why he said this. Uh, it's not clear if he was simply trying to drive up the stock, if he was trying to distract all of us from the uh, problems that Tesla has had in man actually manufacturing autos, which is what they're supposed to be doing, or there's something else going on. Does he really have this money uh, uh, lined up, the funding lined up? Uh, all of that brings us to an article that uh, Ben DiPietro wrote earlier this week in the Wall Street Journal about this tweets could bring regulatory scrutiny because you can't really disclose that type of information uh, if it's not true. So uh, the SEC has opened an investigation, and so we'll just have to see uh, where that goes and or wait for the next tweet from uh, Mr. Musk. Uh, I, I like the conspiracy theory that was just uh, put forth by our colleague, Matt Kelly, that we will be broadcasting on an upcoming Everything Compliance and Matt was wondering if there was any significance to the take private share price of 420. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, those of you who know what that happens at that time of day know what we're talking about. Um, right. Next, uh, next up, we've got something from uh, Harry Casson in the FCPA blog, and this is uh, one of Tom's favorite cases that we always keep coming back to the 1MDB uh, fund from Malaysia that has been looted over the years. And um, Harry takes a look at the fact that um, the boat that belongs to, um, it's actually a super uh, $25 million super yacht that once that, belonged to- $250 million. Oh, Thank I you. said 25. Okay. So anyhow, uh, they were able to get the uh, ship back uh, from Indonesia and sail it to um, Malaysia. The ship is called the Equanimity. And uh, the question now is going to be uh, whether as a result of mutual legal assistance treaties between the Indonesia, U.S. and Malaysian governments, if the U.S. government will be able to seize this $250 million vessel to start paying back some of the looting of the fund. So uh, the equanimity costs over $730,000 a month to maintain, and authorities from the U.S., Switzerland, Singapore, and Malaysia are chasing uh, low for his, his, his alleged role in the $4.5 billion looting of 1MDB. So uh, those are big numbers, huh? 
So uh, in addition to your um, fellow Californian, Mr. Musk, you also uh, have a tie to uh, to this story, Jay, because uh, you're actually getting ready to go on a cruise yourself. So I can see the uh, the interest here, two hundred fifty million dollar super yacht, uh, you know, the Rosen family on a cruise. Uh, you know, it's it's becoming clear now that this is really kind of a, a Jay Rosen theme week. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> So, Tom, tell us about um, recently uh, the DOJ announced in a public release the Cyber Digital Task Force first report. What were the highlights of that? So, first of all, we we have to note that in in spite of the president claiming there's never been a cyber attack, uh, if there was a cyber attack, it wasn't Russia, uh, but it won't be a cyber attack going forward because Russia would never do it again. If it did, it did it the first time, but it didn't. Um, we do have uh, some serious people looking at this issue from the United States government perspective. And we have the Department of Justice with the Cyber Digital Task Force. They've issued a report. They addressed a couple of questions or uh, in the report what the Department of Justice is doing to address global cyber threats and what the DOJ can do to accomplish this mission more effectively. They laid out uh, certain uh, uh, steps they're going to take. And frankly, uh, I think it was a, a welcome uh, will welcome uh, report given the president's um, kind of blind spot on this. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein explained that the uh, task force had six general categories of threats, malign foreign influence operations, damage to computer systems, data theft, cyber enabled fraud schemes, threats to personal security and attacks on critical infrastructure, which they're going to be monitoring and reporting on going forward. So uh, kudos to the Department of Justice uh, for putting this task force together and releasing this first report. And I just want to call attention to one of my favorite, my, my most favorite new acronym, the Cloud Act, which stands for Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act. Whoever figured that out, he, deser- he or she deserves a raise. Yeah, you know that's probably another rose and tie because I'm sure it's a it's a recovering <laughs> screenwriter, uh, because only a screenwriter would uh, have that kind of brain power that would think of something like that. So you know this really is is becoming uh, this week with Jay Rosen. So uh, kudos, kudos. You know Jay. there are people people who came up with Smirsh and Spectre, right? So uh, exactly. people have talents. Yeah. Jay, there's a couple of stories that uh, uh, around money laundering, and uh, I, I, I guess they both surprised me a little. You want to tell us about uh, the Canadian angle? Yeah. Oh, and once so, again, uh, uh, you're going to Canada for your multi-billion dollar <laughs> yacht cruise. So here we go with yet another Jay Rosenthal. Are you, so, are you getting ready to buy some property for cash? I think so. Um, <laughs> Canada's record of fighting money laundering is under fire at home and abroad. And this report comes to us from uh, Wall Street Journal's Alistair McDonald, Paul Vieira, and Vipal Monga. And two-thirds of the Canadian banks examined by regulators have significant levels of noncompliance with anti-money laundering rules, according to a report released by uh, lawmakers and uh, reviewed by the Wall Street Journal. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, those of Dudley Do-Right fame, have estimated in 2011 that between $3.8 billion to $11.5 billion of dollars or Canadian dollars are laundered in the country annually. And uh, this seems to be a, a situation where Different parts of the government um, are not speaking to each other, and there are several factors that stymie the efforts of reporting, including strict privacy laws making it difficult to obtain warrants, a reluctance to prosecute, and the failure in some cases of banks to report suspicious transactions. So these are uh, usually the impediments to uh, clamping down on uh, money laundering, but it's uh, I think interesting that Canada has uh, come into the spotlight. So uh, I wanted to really book in this with uh, looking at it from the lower 48 perspective, Jay, because Jacqueline Jagger in Compliance Week reported that 24 attorneys generals were pushing Congress 
to um, give greater shell company transparency. And the significance for me of this, Jay, was previously uh, states had resisted any effort, any national federal uh, effort to regulate shell companies or require transparency or require the information be provided to the federal government. And now we have over almost rather half the states asking the um, uh, ranking uh, chairman of uh, the House Judiciary Committee, or excuse me, House Financial Services Committee, Jeb Hensarling, to uh, to move these and change these laws. So I think this is a, a great step. We previously had the state of Delaware uh, has withdrawn their uh, 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 desires. Objection. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, so with um, this number of attorney generals, with Drawing their objections, we can only hope that there will be some uh, some move to uh, de-anonymize shell corporations uh, going forward. So I'm looking at this list, and I see the great states of California and Massachusetts mentioned, but neither of our birth states, Texas nor New Hampshire, make the list. Uh, any insight into that? Well, New Hampshire, it's obvious. Uh, you know, who would ever want to buy property in New Hampshire? Uh, Texas, uh, you know, we have a corrupt attorney general, so uh, it's no no surprise there uh, that uh, they would not be a part of this. He's uh, under indictment uh, for criminal violations of securities laws. So, uh, but, uh, you know, once again, um, uh, Jay Rosen, tie. <laughs> All right. I, I, I'm interested to see how you tie this next one in to me. Um, we have a couple articles we're looking at. One is from uh, Tammy Whitehouse. Uh, at Compliance Week, and her article is entitled Company Shift Gears and Final Push to Adopt Lease Rules. And then, as always, our uh, colleague Matt Kelly is going to take a look through his radical compliance lens and talk about thoughts on changes to lease accountings. And um, although accounting was not my forte at Wharton, uh, I will try to do my best on this. And it appears that in the past, uh, if you had a lease obligation, so say you had a property and you had five years uh, to lease it, and um, you could connect, uh, you could capture this in a footnote uh, on your reports to the SEC, but it was not an actual liability uh, that you were reflecting. So the way Matt looks at this, when you start to look at different metrics on how a co profitable a company is, or if uh, an executive is being tied to uh, a return on assets, by more accurately reflecting these leases, you potentially uh, bring down that um, KPI, which somebody may be getting uh, compensated by. So that's one caveat there. And the other thing is this, again, seems to be uh, kind of like the run-up to GDPR, that companies have known about uh, this c c accounting standard codification topic 842 and that uh, it needs to be in place by January 1st, 2019. So uh, there are um, people who are scrambling to do this. But, uh, again, this is something that bears watching uh, in the months running up towards it. Tom, any thoughts on your part? Well, I mean, the connection to Jay Rosen is obvious. You just bought a new house, and this is about lease obligations. So it's all <laughs> part of uh, your your greater real estate, super yacht, uh, empire, uh, and, of course, your affiliation with Elon Musk. But, uh, yeah, uh, I, I really wanted to highlight this, Jay, because you really you noted – there are some big changes coming and companies need to get ready for this. You literally could go from in the black to the end of the, in the red uh, by having to account for your lease obligations on a go forward basis. But the other thing it brought up for me is uh, what are the collateral collateral consequences? Are companies going to have uh, uh, clauses which lets them get out of leases if valuations change for reasons unrelated to the real estate they're in? And what does that do to the real estate company sitting across the table negotiating a lease? Does that impact their revenue recognition? Uh, what are the corporate governance issues around this? So um, this has been really under the radar. Thanks to Tammy and Matt for uh, bringing it to our attention. And I just hope that the appropriate corporate functions are looking at this. 
Uh, we have a new voice in the ethics and compliance community. So why don't you uh, tell us about Jonathan Rausch and what he's thinking about this week? So Jonathan Rausch is the former uh, senior vice president and head of anti-bribery and corruption governance at Wells Fargo. And he has started a new blog post called Dipping Through Geometries. Now, I haven't been able to ask him what's the provenance of that name, but it's a subtitle perspective on law and compliance. And he's been doing it, up, I would say, about 10 days or two weeks. Uh, I'm not quite sure when he began, but it's just been an excellent plethora of those two topics, Jay, perspectives on law and compliance. So today it was on German and Lithuanian prosecutors. Uh, yesterday, Barbadian uh, official arrested and charged with laundering money. Um, arrests at the Finn seven cyber crimes. Um, <clears throat> reports on cyber cryptocurrency ICOs and blockchains. And uh, the stuff is really interesting, uh, very well written. Uh, and I'm greatly looking forward to talking to him uh, about what uh, what the purpose is, what the provenance is, and and where he's going to be going forward with it. But we've linked to the site in the show notes, and I urge everyone to uh, to check it out. So um, I, I hear we have a milestone coming for you. When does that exactly occur? Well, um, sometime next week. It's not, it's not quite clear. It may have already happened. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, will have produced. Uh, 1,000 podcasts at some point next week, Jay. And uh, to celebrate this milestone, we I am running a couple of different uh, celebrations this month. I'm celebrating it the entire month. I call it the uh, the month of uh, 1,000 podcasts or the land of 1,000 podcasts. And I'm doing a weekly series to highlight some area that interests me. So I had a preview uh, in late July with the intersection of Shakespeare and compliance. Uh, this week, I've been running a series on the intersection of Sherlock Holmes and innovation and compliance. Next week, I'm running a series on the future of internal audit, compliance, and analytics. Um, <clears throat> I'm running a uh, series uh, with uh, affiliated monitors. Uh, the third week in August on looking at ethical culture in a corporation. And I'm currently planning on a series on opinion releases the last week in August. These are all uh, short 10-minute podcasts. They're released uh, on batch release on Monday, all five. Uh, it's released daily on my site and on uh, JD Supra. I've had a lot of fun producing them. Uh, I'm also doing a special retrospective uh, episodes for each of my podcasts where I asked my uh, podcast partner to, to really take a look at where we have, where we were five years ago, where we are now, what's changed, and where we, we may be going in the future. We'll have to figure out how to do that in a uh, in, uh, special this week in FCPA, Jay. So I hope uh, our fans and listeners will uh, enjoy this. I've certainly enjoyed uh, putting it together, producing them, and, and putting them out there uh, it's been a, a great journey for me. I've really enjoyed the podcast format. It's given us a way to, to joke around and have some fun, maybe uh, give a few lessons learned and, and talk about some of the things that uh, we think are important each week. Yeah, well, I've, I've enjoyed my 115 episodes plus the, I think, what, 30 plus on everything compliant. So I'm, um, I'm glad to have uh, been able to participate with you and uh, wish you a uh, uh, lots of luck and success on your next 1000 podcast. Well, I really appreciate that. So Jay, I think that actually uh, brings us to the end this week. You want to uh, take us, uh, take us all home. Sure. So uh, on behalf of Tom Fox, the compliance evangelist who always bats a thousand in my book, we'd like to thank you for joining us for this week in FCPA episode 115 for the week ending August 10th, 2018, the Boston Massacre edition, or AKA J. Rosen's Cruise to Alaska. Thanks for joining us and have a great weekend. This conference will now be recorded. J. Rosen, do you have a rant for us today? I certainly do. Uh, last night, uh, 
I happened to watch ESPN for the first time, and I saw that we are in preseason uh, football. And I should have known about that because of uh, the Hall of Fame recipients in Canton, Ohio last weekend. So bringing on football, I was wondering which NFLers would be <clears throat> taking a knee in protest. And a couple weeks ago, the NFL announced a policy that uh, players could privately spend time in the locker room and they wouldn't need to have to be out there during the national anthem. But on the first night of league play, uh, Kenny Stills and Albert Wilson at the Miami Dolphins took a knee. Uh, other players uh, chose to raise their fist in protest. People protested on the um, Philadelphia Eagles, the world champion Philadelphia Eagles. So you can bet that it didn't take less than 128 characters for the president to comment upon this. So uh, what looked like uh, some kind of labor piece that the NFL had uh, come to with the Players Association looks like after one week it's already in tatters. So uh, we will be interested to see what happens uh, in the media. And this will be uh, another distraction between the NFL and the White House. So uh, that is my rant. And um, go Patriots and go Red Sox. Thanks. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to This Week in FCPA. If you have any questions on this podcast, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. I hope you will join us again next week where we will review the week's top compliance and ethics stories. This Week in FCPA is produced by the Compliance Podcast Network.